Senator Lindsey Graham, RSC, is urging Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, DNY, to advance bipartisan legislation to impose sanctions on the International Criminal Court, ICC. This call to action follows the ICC prosecutor's announcement seeking arrest warrants for Israeli leaders, including President Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, as well as three Hamas officials citing war crimes amid the Gaza conflict. Graham praised Schumer's condemnation of the ICC's actions, but insisted that strong legislative measures are needed to prevent future threats from the court, including those against American personnel. Schumer condemned the ICC's decision, labeling it as biased and profoundly unfair, arguing that it inappropriately equates Israel's self-defense with Hamas's terrorism. Both Schumer and President Biden denounced the ICC's move, with Schumer emphasizing the need for unwavering support for Israel and vowing to collaborate with Biden and others to maintain that support. France, Belgium, and Slovenia have expressed support for the International Criminal Court, ICC, and its chief prosecutor's request for arrest warrants for Israeli and Hamas leaders following accusations of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Gaza and Israel. The ICC prosecutor, Karim Khan, named Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, and three Hamas leaders in his announcement. This move, condemned by Israel and the United States, has intensified Israel's isolation. In response, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant criticized the ICC's decision, describing it as an attempt to deny Israel's right to self-defense. Concurrently, Israeli forces conducted a raid in the West Bank city of Jenin, killing at least seven people and wounding several others, amid ongoing violence in the region. Additionally, Germany has expressed condolences for the death of Iranian President Ebrahim Raisi in a helicopter crash, and Sri Lanka has declared a national day of mourning in his honor. Israel plans to expand its military operation in Rafah, a southern city in Gaza, according to Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. Gallant communicated this to U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, despite U.S. concerns about potential civilian casualties. Israel views Rafah as the last significant stronghold of Hamas and aims to dismantle their capabilities and rescue hostages believed to be held there since Hamas's October 7th attack. Since May 6th, Israel has ordered evacuations and initiated troop and tank incursions in Rafah. Over 810,000 people are estimated to have fled the city, according to the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. Israel has assured humanitarian safeguards, although there are concerns from Western powers and Egypt about the displaced Palestinians' well-being. Israeli forces have reportedly found tunnels in Rafah leading from the Sinai, a claim Egypt has denied. Russian physicist Anatoly Maslov was sentenced to 14 years in a penal colony for treason, part of a series of cases against experts in hypersonic missile technology. Maslov, 77, was convicted in a closed trial and maintained his innocence. He is one of three scientists from the Siberian Institute arrested on similar charges, with Alexander Shipliuk and Valery Zvegintsev still awaiting trial. The scientists are accused of sharing state secrets through their theoretical work on hypersonic missiles, a technology Russia claims to lead in and has used in the Ukraine war. Their lawyer, Olga Dinzi, stated that Maslov, who has heart problems, plans to appeal, describing him as a dedicated scientist who lived modestly and rejected opportunities to work abroad. Colleagues and his lawyer argue that the charges are unfounded, claiming the shared information was vetted and publicly available. These cases are said to have a chilling effect on Russian academia, deterring scientists from their work. Lawyer Yevgeny Smirnov suggests that these prosecutions are politically motivated, aimed at demonstrating Russia's vigilance against foreign espionage, despite the alleged information being publicly accessible. The Kremlin insists the charges are serious and under the purview of security services. Poland's Prime Minister, Donald Tusk, has announced the reinstatement of a commission to investigate alleged Russian and Belarusian influence in the country, citing concerns over Moscow's efforts to destabilize Poland. The commission, headed by General Yaroslaw Strozik of the Military Counterintelligence Service, will examine influence spanning from 2004 to 2024. 
This move marks a reversal for Tusk, as the commission was initially established by the previous nationalist government and criticized by Tusk's civic coalition as a political tool. Tusk revealed that nine individuals had been arrested for sabotage on Russian orders, with, th with three more detained recently. He also mentioned ongoing investigations into the potential Russian involvement in a major fire in a Warsaw shopping center. Tusk highlighted the influx of migrants at Poland's border with Belarus, suggesting that most of them possess Russian visas, implying orchestrated efforts rather than spontaneous migration. Poland plans to invest 10 billion zlotys to secure its eastern border amid escalating tensions. Moldova has become the first country to sign a security and defense partnership with the European Union, as announced by EU foreign policy chief Josep Borrell. Led by pro-European President Maya Sandu, Moldova aims to join the EU by 2030 and has strongly condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The partnership is expected to bolster Moldova's resilience against common security challenges and facilitate more effective engagement with the EU. Moldovan Prime Minister Doran Racine emphasized that EU accession would provide the best mechanism for peace and stability for Moldovan citizens, while describing the security and defense partnership as a significant step forward in enhancing peace, security, and prosperity. In March, President Sandu signed a defense cooperation agreement with France, warning of Russia's efforts to destabilize Moldova. Moldova's relations with Moscow have deteriorated amid Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin are scheduled to meet in Kazakhstan in July, marking their second meeting in two months. This meeting follows Xi's hosting of Putin in China, where both leaders pledged to strengthen political, diplomatic, economic, and military ties amidst increasing pressure from the West. The upcoming meeting is set to take place during the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, summit in Astana, Kazakhstan. China and Russia, both founding members of the SCO, are committed to enhancing mutual support and joint efforts to ensure stability in their shared region. They also discussed various pressing issues, including the Middle East peace process, developments in the Red Sea region, and the situation on the Korean Peninsula. China has been increasingly focused on bolstering ties with Central Asian countries to counter perceived U.S.-led containment efforts in the Indo-Pacific region. Xi has pledged economic, infrastructure, and security support to Central Asian states, emphasizing deepening mutual trust and cooperation. During a meeting with Kazakh Foreign Minister Murat Nurtlu, China reiterated its commitment to expanding energy cooperation, importing more agricultural products, and enhancing cross-border transport infrastructure, including the construction of a third cross-border railway. Both countries aim to create favorable conditions for strengthening cooperation, particularly through the China-Europe Railway Express that links numerous cities between China and Europe via Kazakhstan. The Nigerian army has rescued 350 hostages, primarily women and children, from Boko Haram extremists in the Sambisa forest in northeastern Nigeria. This operation, which took several days, freed 209 children, 135 women, and six men who had been held captive for months or even years. Many of the women and girls had babies, likely born from forced marriages or rapes by the militants. The hostages, transported to the Borno State Government House, appeared exhausted and in worn-out clothes. Some hostages described the difficulty of escaping due to their children and the severe punishments for attempted escape. The Sambisa Forest, a former forest reserve now used as a Boko Haram hideout, was the site of this rescue mission where some extremists were killed and their makeshift homes destroyed. Boko Haram has been waging an insurgency since 2009 to establish Islamic Sharia law in Nigeria, resulting in at least 35,000 deaths and the displacement of 2.1 million people. Boko Haram's abductions have included high-profile cases such as the kidnapping of 276 schoolgirls from Chibok in 2014. Since then, abductions have been widespread, especially in Nigeria's northwestern and central regions, where armed groups frequently kidnap villagers and travelers for ransom. Kosovo police have closed six branches of Serbia-licensed Postal Savings Bank, enforcing a ban on the use of the Serbian dinar currency. 
This decision, effective from February 1st, mandates that ethnic Serb-dominated areas in Kosovo adopt the euro, aligning with the rest of the country. The closure has heightened tensions with Serbia, which provides financial support to ethnic Serbs in Kosovo and Dinars. The Kosovo government delayed the enforcement by three months following pressure from the European Union and the United States, who were concerned about the impact on the ethnic Serb minority in northern Kosovo. Most of Kosovo already uses the euro, despite not being an EU member, but northern regions with significant ethnic Serb populations continue to use the dinar. The EU and U.S. are urging Serbia and Kosovo to implement agreements reached in early 2023 aimed at normalizing relations. However, progress has been slow, exacerbated by a violent incident last September involving Serb gunmen and Kosovo police, which resulted in four deaths. Both Serbia and Kosovo aspire to join the EU, but their ongoing disputes and lack of compromise threaten their accession prospects. The conflict traces back to a 1998-99 war between Serbian forces and ethnic Albanian separatists, which ended after a NATO intervention. Kosovo declared independence in 2008, but Serbia does not recognize it. The Philippines aims to become a key manufacturing and logistics hub in Asia, leveraging its strengthened ties with the United States. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. highlighted the country's ambitions at the 6th Indo-Pacific Business Forum in Manila, emphasizing increased defense and economic cooperation with Washington. The U.S. has pledged to support investments in transport infrastructure, clean energy, and semiconductor supply chains through the Luzon Economic Corridor. Marcos outlined an infrastructure program consisting of 185 priority projects worth 9.5 trillion pesos, $163 billion, to boost the nation's logistics capabilities. These initiatives aim to improve freight transport, mobility, and access to economic zones, positioning the Philippines as a regional center for agribusiness and logistics. This strategy puts the Philippines in competition with regional neighbors like Vietnam and Indonesia, which are also vying for investments amid efforts by the U.S. and its allies to reduce dependence on China. Despite being one of the region's fastest-growing economies, the Philippines has lagged behind in attracting foreign direct investments, with net inflows dropping 7% to $8.9 billion last year. The Business Forum is part of U.S. efforts to strengthen economic ties with the Philippines, complementing bolstered defense relations amid tensions with China over the South China Sea. The Forum followed a trilateral summit between the U.S., Philippines, and Japan, where the Allies committed to enhancing investment partnerships and security ties. Marcos emphasized the importance of integrating the Philippines into global value chains and attracting more foreign direct investments to sustain economic growth, asserting that a strong Philippine economy would be a valuable regional ally. The U.S. Army is expanding its Joint Pacific Multinational Combat Training Center, JPMRC to the Philippines to support the country's shift towards territorial defense operations. The center will be set up at Fort Magsaysay in central Luzon, enhancing training capabilities for large-scale events, including jungle and special operations training. The initiative follows major joint exercises, Salaknib and Balaikatan, between U.S. and Philippine forces, emphasizing long-range air assaults and integrated operations. The JPMRC's deployment to the Philippines includes advanced instrumentation to monitor and assess various aspects of combat simulations, such as indirect fire effectiveness and casualty treatment. The U.S. Army is transporting technology from Hawaii to enable this training, marking a significant effort to support the Philippines' defense modernization. The U.S. Army plans to continue similar training exercises in the region, with future deployments of JPMRC capabilities to Thailand and other Pacific locations as part of Operation Pathways, a series of collaborative exercises with Indo-Pacific allies. China has imposed sanctions on former U.S. Congressman Mike Gallagher, barring him from entering the country and freezing his assets within China. This action comes in response to Gallagher's perceived interference in China's internal affairs, particularly due to his vocal criticism of China and strong support for Taiwan. Gallagher's visit to Taiwan in February, where he met with both the former and current presidents, drew particular attention and condemnation from Beijing.
China's move underscores its sensitivity regarding foreign support for Taiwan and its ongoing efforts to assert control over the island, which it considers a separatist territory. The Vatican has extended another significant gesture towards China, affirming the Catholic Church's commitment to respecting Chinese sovereignty and acknowledging past mistakes made by Western missionaries. The event commemorated a pivotal 1924 meeting in Shanghai, which emphasized the need for local leadership in the Chinese church. Notably, Shanghai Bishop Joseph Shen Bin, the first mainland bishop allowed by Beijing to participate in a public Vatican event, emphasized the importance of a Chinese perspective within the Catholic Church. Pope Francis emphasized the significance of the 1924 meeting and highlighted the need for the church to adapt to Chinese society. The Vatican's ongoing efforts to reconcile with China aim to unite the country's Catholic population, which has been divided between state-recognized and underground churches. Despite challenges and past violations of agreements, the Vatican seeks to ensure that Catholicism in China remains free from foreign political influence and aligned with local culture and society. ASML Holding NV and Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co. TSMC have contingency plans to remotely disable their advanced chip-making machines if China were to invade Taiwan, sources familiar with the matter revealed. The U.S. government has expressed concerns privately to Dutch and Taiwanese officials about the potential consequences of a Chinese attack on Taiwan, given its pivotal role in semiconductor production. ASML, the world's sole manufacturer of extreme ultraviolet EUV machines crucial for chip production, has reassured authorities about its ability to remotely shut down these machines in such a scenario. This capability applies to ASML's EUV machines, utilized predominantly by TSMC, which are essential for producing cutting-edge microchips with various applications, including military uses. The Netherlands, where ASML is based, has conducted simulations to evaluate the risks associated with a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. ASML's technology has been subject to export controls due to fears of it falling into the wrong hands, with the Netherlands banning the sale of EUV machines to China under U.S. pressure. Despite these measures, Chinese technological advancements pose ongoing challenges, with evidence suggesting that Huawei has made strides in chip production using ASML printers and tools from U.S. suppliers. The geopolitical tensions surrounding Taiwan's status have escalated, with China asserting territorial claims over the island and the U.S. Congress approving substantial aid to bolster its defenses. In response to the semiconductor supply chain's vulnerability, the Biden administration is also taking steps to enhance domestic chip production. Given Taiwan's critical role in chip manufacturing, safeguarding its sovereignty has become paramount for maintaining global technological leadership. Vietnamese officials have urged Apple supplier Foxconn and other manufacturers to voluntarily reduce power usage by 30% at their assembly plants in the northern region, following electricity outages last year. This request, aimed at preventing a recurrence of last summer's power shortage, has been characterized as an encouragement rather than a mandate and has not affected production. Vietnam, increasingly attracting multinational companies seeking to diversify from China, relies on foreign investment for economic growth, particularly in energy-intensive industries like semiconductor manufacturing. The country experienced a power shortage last year due to a heat wave, resulting in significant economic losses. Prime Minister Pham Min Chin has assured foreign investors that such shortages will not recur, with measures including delaying maintenance at coal-fired power plants to meet increased electricity demand during hot months. While specific details about the requests and their duration remain undisclosed, energy-saving measures have been implemented nationwide to mitigate potential shortages. However, foreign chambers of commerce have called on the government to ensure a stable power supply, citing concerns among semiconductor companies about investment decisions being delayed due to supply risks.